This is the lecture for the urinary system and the first part of homeostasis. There is going to be a second lecture posted on homeostasis, kind of focusing more on acid-base balance as well as some other factors that will be posted over the weekend. You do have a quiz coming up, um, and that quiz is going to be available from Monday at 11.59 p.m. until Wednesday at 11.59 p.m., um, same as all the other quizzes. Uh, it will focus primarily on the muscular system, muscular physiology, as well as the urinary system and the first part of homeostasis. So basically this lecture and the last lecture. The new material that's introduced right over the weekend, right before the quiz, will not be on the quiz. So just the first two lectures since the last lecture exam. Um, people are just about done taking the exam. I think we have that all worked out. So I will be posting that exam resource about lecture exam two very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Just a few points about what I want you to focus on here. Um, we're looking at macroscopic and microscopic structures of the kidney and nephron. In terms of macroscopic structures, uh, it's really just a review of anatomy, but there are a couple of points I want to make that tie into physiology. With microscopic structures, that's what we're relying most heavily on in understanding the physiology of the nephron. There's a lot of different processes that are involved with the nephron, including filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion. And all of those are different, so you should pay attention to those and understand when those are happening at different points. The nephron, as you learned in anatomy, is the functional unit of the kidney, and different parts of it are very crucial and do very different things. So you should be able to diagram that process of filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and ultimately excretion um, of components of blood through the nephron of the kidney uh, in your information. And you should be able to do this by naming individual structures of the nephron, which should be a review from anatomy, describing concentration, gradients, and osmoregulation at specific points, and tracing the path of specific molecules. So I think that this is a lot easier to learn uh, when you have your professor in front of you in person. So again, I have office hours every Friday and I'm happy to diagram the nephron on the board. That being said, I also posted a YouTube video um, from a channel called Handwritten Notes, which I think is very helpful. Um, and he does a great job kind of describing this process. So I highly, highly recommend that you watch that. It's in this week's module uh, in the additional study resource section. You should also be able to calculate net filtration pressure and relate that back to glomerular filtration rate and understand why GFR is important and what happens when it's too low. Um, you should be able to analyze data from common clinical tests, specifically a urinalysis, but also understanding basic stuff about glomerular filtration rate and net filtration pressure to make predictions about patient health. And you should be able to explain the relationship between caffeine intake, ADH production, kidney physiology, and urine volume through words, drawings, or a concept map. We're going to start with uh, the bulk of this lecture again will be chapter 25, so that's what we're starting with uh, thinking about the urinary system. We're going to talk briefly about physical characteristics of urine, get into um, a, a brief review of anatomy, so uh, gross anatomy of urine transport, so like the whole excretory or urinary system, um, and then specifically focusing on the kidneys. Um, get into microscopic anatomy of the kidney, so going a little bit more in depth than you probably went in anatomy, and then getting really into the physiology of your information. Um, we'll also cover tubular reabsorption um, and the urinary system and homeostasis. Sections seven through nine um, are kind of touched on in different parts of this lecture, um, so they are important, but not necessarily in their own section. They're worked into other sections. Okay, so the first thing that I want you to do is take a quick look at this challenge statement. It might look kind of weird at first, uh, depending on how much you remember um, the formation of urine, uh, but go ahead and look at the statement, urine is made from blood, and think about whether you agree with that statement or disagree, and think about why you agree or disagree. What have you learned in previous classes that makes you think the way you do? So I'm gonna give you a few seconds to think about that. So when I look at this statement, I would say that I agree with this. Urine is not blood, but it's certainly made 
from components that are found in blood and through the filtration of blood. And we'll look at some data over the course of this lecture that shows similarities and differences between urine, filtrate, and blood plasma. Before we get much further, I wanted to outline some primary processes that are involved uh, in the urinary system and specifically throughout the nephron. Um, and so for the exam and just for basic understanding of physiology, you should know the distinction between these processes. So filtration is specifically the movement of substances through the glomerulus, um, that bundle of capillaries at the start of the nephron, uh, and through Bowman's capsule to form filtrate. So it's the formation of fil uh, a filtrate. Filtration is the formation of filtrate, um, and it's coming from blood plasma. Um, so that's really important. It's maintaining homeostasis by filtrating blood plasma but we're not having formed elements coming through. And if we have formed elements like blood cells and platelets, that can be really bad. So we'll get back to that in just a moment. Reabsorption is uh, getting some of that material back because a lot of stuff enters into our nephrons as filtrate and we don't want to lose it. We want to hang on to it. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we do want to get rid of, but we have to go through this process of filtration and then reabsorption to get some of the material back. So it's capturing material from the filtrate back into the bloodstream. And so this is happening along the nephron. The opposite of that is secretion. So that's when capillaries that are along the nephron, so not at the glomerulus, but kind of wrapped along like paratubular capillaries um, and different vessels like that, uh, when material from that goes into the nephron. So secretion and reabsorption are opposite processes. And then any material that's left in the nephron as it extends into the collecting ducts and then out of the kidneys is uh, the process of excretion. So it's urine leaving the collecting ducts. And at that point, it's properly urine. Until that, uh, until that point, it's um, filtrate or forming urine. So when we're thinking about what urine actually is, um, it can range quite a bit in volume per day. Um, its pH ranges all the way from 4.5 to 8. Um, it, it has a lot of solutes in it, uh, urobilinogen. Um, sometimes it has white blood cells, but certainly not red blood cells. Um, it should not have any glucose in it. It should not have any nitrites in it. It should have nitrates, but nitrites are often symptomatic of bacteria should not have huge proteins um, and has kind of low bilirubin, um, but that kind of contributes to the color. Uh, it does have a lot of stuff like ions, amino acids, vitamins, and waste products that are floating around in our blood. So some of the components of blood are there, but some of the components like blood <laughs> cells, like red blood cells are missing. Um, so it's similar, but different to blood. Um, so Really, the goal of the kidneys is to change the composition of our blood plasma to remove waste um, and maintain homeostatic balance. We're constantly taking in more water. We need that water, but our blood pressure changes. We respond to different stimuli, um, and we have to kind of get rid of a lot of that water, too. Um, we also have to get rid of a lot of metabolic waste products. Um, and if we are not able to do this, if our kidneys are not functioning, we can have problems um, like metabolic acidosis or alkalosis, anemia, systemic edema, um, heart arrhythmia, fatigue, lethargy, shortness of breath. So very widespread issues. When we're looking just at urine, like not even thinking about filtration rate um, or different factors like that, when we're just studying urine, that process is called urinalysis, and it's a very important diagnostic tool. So a lot of us learn very early on that the color of our urine gives us an indication of how hydrated we are, with pale yellow urine indicating hydration and darker gold to brown urine indicating dehydration. Um, this is influenced a lot by your diet, your metabolism, environmental factors, um, and also medical conditions. And there's lots of medications uh, that have pigment groups that change the color of your urine. Um, but we can also look at the volume of the urine. So if you're basically not urinating, that's called anuria. Um, decreased urine production is called oliguria. So a lig, like a lego, meaning a small piece. 
so decreased, not gone completely, but a lot lower than it should be. And then poly or multiple polyuria is excessive urine production. So we can look at the color, we can look at the volume, and then we can do a full urinalysis and come up with a lot of the other factors that we've looked at in the previous slide or a couple slides ago. So if we look at a case study here, um, it's looking at the color, dark yellow, clarity is whether it's clear or turbid, which is cloudy. This one is turbid. Um, it has information about pH and specific gravity. Uh, it looks good in terms of blood glucose, or in, sorry, in terms of uh, glucose in the urine, there's none there. Um, there's no blood cells, no ketones, no protein, no urobilinogen or bilirubin, um, but there is leukocyte esterase and nitrate. So remember, nitrate is normal, nitrite is not, and going from nitrate to nitrite is indicative of the uh, processes of different types of bacteria. Um, and so this also has a much higher white blood cell count than normal. Um, and it does have some red blood cells, but within the reference range. So that elevated white blood cell count, that leukocyte esterase and nitrite uh, positivity, um, all give indications that there's probably some sort of infection going on with this patient. And when you look at the bacteria, um, it there is bacteria present in this sample. So this urinalysis is important for diagnosing, in this case, a urinary tract infection. But there's a lot of other conditions that can be determined using urinalysis. So you might have heard um, about uh, diabetes mellitus and this idea that the urine smells sweet, there's glucose in the urine. So we'll talk about that um, as a condition in a little bit, um, but that's often diagnosed through urinalysis or just basic kind of smells and observations of the urine. So getting into how urine um, is transported through our body, uh, the formation is occurring in the kidneys, which we'll get back to in a little bit, um, but blood is filtered and urine is produced in the kidneys. There's two of them. You should know where they are by now, but just in case you don't, there's one right there and one right there. Um, and then material flows from the kidneys into the ureters, which are these tubes right here and that gets transported to the bladder, which is right here. And then um, the bladder, the urinary bladder stores urine uh, until it's ready to be released through the urethra. So we'll walk our way through some of those different components. Um, and remember that the kidneys are where that filtration and production of urine is actually happening. So we'll get back to that in a little bit. So the ureters are very important for transporting material from the kidneys to where they're stored in the bladder. Um, there's two of them, one corresponding with each uh, bladder. Um, and so in this image, you can see them in green right here and right here. So they emerge from the renal pelvis, which is where a lot of those tubes are centered in the center of the kidneys, um, and they enter the bladder, um, and they kind of go up and then down. And so oftentimes when we talk about valves, we, um, or when they kind of go uh, out to the side too. So oftentimes when we talk about valves, like in blood vessels, it's a physical valve. Um, and so that's an anatomical valve, like in your blood vessels or your heart. Um, but the ureters actually form a physiological valve. It's just in terms of the flow of material and general um, pressure and um, physical forces rather than an actual anatomical valve. Um, and this is what the cross section of the ureter looks like. And then the urinary bladder is also interesting. It can range uh, quite a bit in volume from zero mils to 600 mils in adults. That's about as much as it can store. Um, the peritoneum uh, from the abdomen, or the peritoneum at the top of the bladder extends into the abdomen. There's a very special muscle that makes up the bulk of the bladder and it starts out strong, but weakens over time, which contributes to incontinence in older adults. 
And then there's a special type of epithelium that lines the bladder, transitional epithelium. And when the bladder is empty, it's kind of shrunk together. It's not distended or stretched. Um, that transitional epithelium actually appears to be columnar. It looks very tall, uh, but then when it is distended, when it's full of urine, it stretches out, it's transitional, and it looks like it's squamous. It looks flat. So that property allows it to be very highly flexible. And then the urethra is responsible for transporting urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. In people with vulva, it's a lot shorter. In people with penises, it's a lot longer. Um, and it also, uh, in people with penises, it actually uh, interacts with the reproductive system, whereas in people with vulva, it's separate from the reproductive system. So in terms of uh, kind of where the kidney is located and its external anatomy, um, it's on the dorsal portion of the body and thoracic cavity. So if you think about watching um, like a fight and there's a kidney shot, it's on their lower back. Um, so that's where the kidneys are located. Um, and it's covered by really fibrous material to protect it. It has a fat pad, uh, lots of fascia and peritoneum. So it's really anchored nicely in place. And if you've ever uh, di dissected a uh, human before or a fetal pig, you've probably seen how nicely it adheres to the dorsal portion of that cavity. So one thing that I think is kind of interesting, and I already shared this with my anatomy students over the summer, um, but thinking about a kidney transplant. So when I imagined these um, before I started teaching biology many years ago, I imagined them, you know, removing the diseased kidneys and inserting a functional kidney from a donor. Um, but that's not actually what happens. Oftentimes they leave the diseased kidneys in there, attach to their ureters, and just add the transplanted kidney to those other kidneys. Um, so then they connect it to the renal artery and the renal vein. You also transplant the ureter and that connects to the urinary bladder. So the whole setup is added, but nothing is necessarily removed, which I think is super interesting. Okay, so remember that the kidney, when we uh, cut it longitudinally um, and kind of open it up like a book, there's the renal cortex, which is the outer portion, and the renal medulla, which is in the middle, um, and then there's the other parts that we'll talk about next. So in terms of that internal anatomy, there's the renal columns, which separate out internal kidney structures, um, and so we can see those right here. That is a renal column. There's the renal pyramids, which are these cone-shaped structures right here and here. Um, and so they have um, nephrons tightly packed together in them, and you can actually see them on ultrasounds, which is also kind of interesting. Um, and then the rena papillae are where the collecting ducts come together down here um, to take material out and then transition into the ureters. So they, uh, so a um, papilla will extend into a calyx, plurals calyces, those come together and those are what directly extends into the ureter. There's also the renal hilum, which is where all of those vessels connect together. So the different blood vessels, nerves, lymphatic vessels, and the ureters, um, that's this area right here. So the renal hilum. Um, so there's direct connections also with the descending aorta. So the renal artery connects to the descending aorta. The renal vein connects to the inferior vena cava. So these are major blood vessels that are very closely connected to those vessels um, entering and coming out of the heart. So that renal artery, um, as it brings blood in, has to really decrease in diameter in order to get into individual glomeruli um, and also increase in surface area for filtration. And that filtration is happening at that relationship between the glomerulus and the nephron, specifically Bowman's capsule. Um, so that nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Humans have anywhere from 200,000 to 2.5 million of them and about 1 million on average. So there's a lot of blood vessels near the nephron. There's um, the glomerulus, 
uh, and blood is entering that through the afferent arterioles. So remember arteries to arterioles to capillaries. Um, so we have the arteries coming off of the renal artery, the afferent arteriole, and then um, after blood flows through the filtering units that we'll talk about in just a moment, um, it continues to flow and there's lots of vessels that wrap around the nephron too for secretion and reabsorption. So there's the efferent arterial, there's paratubular capillary network, um, there's a whole venous system and that is all surrounding the nephron so that we have reabsorption and secretion. Um, when we have blood coming in and then being filtered, anatomically that's happening at the renal, renal corpuscle, which consists of the glomerulus, that network of capillaries, as well as Bowman's capsule. So here we want to start thinking about size filtration. We have smaller molecules like water, glucose, different salts, so specifically ions, amino acids, um, and urea and uric acid passing freely through this filtration unit. But cells, platelets, and larger proteins should not be able to pass through. And if they do, we consider there to be glomerular damage. Um, and the material that manages to pass through is now considered filtrate. So when that filtration is happening, that's happening um, at these structures called podocytes. Um, and so remember, there's different types of capillaries with different degrees of leakiness. And the capillaries that are in the glomerulus are extremely leaky. So they have lots of openings, lots of fenestrae or fenestrations. Um, Defenestration means being thrown out of a window, so fenestrae makes you think about windows and openings. Um, and so uh, they are surrounded, um, or these openings, these capillaries are surrounded by podocytes, which have these little structures called pedicels. Um, and so they make these kind of filters that wrap around the capillary. Um, so the pedicels form filtration slits. And any material that passes through the fenestrae of the capillaries and through the filtration slits gets into Bowman's capsule and into the nephron. So that glomerular filtration is really important for separating out small ions, glucose, urea, and uric acid, and creatinine from blood plasma. Um, and so going from plasma to glomerular filtrate, those concentrations remain pretty consistent. Um, but urine tends to be very different. And the reason for that is some things are being concentrated in the urine, uh, some things are being removed from urine. Um, so a lot of filtrate goes into our nephrons and very little urine gets produced in comparison. So rough proportions of things change dramatically. Um, so just a couple examples of that. Um, so here we have a... Oh, pen is kind of weird. We have um, a lot of urea being concentrated in the urine. It's obviously coming from the plasma in the filtrate, but it gets concentrated in the urine, so the amounts are quite different. Same with creatinine. Okay, so that, um, those different components, the filtration slits, the podocytes, the leaky capillaries, all come together to form the endothelial capsular membrane, which is really that filtering unit of the nephron. So the nephron is the, uh, the functional unit of the kidney. It accomplishes filtration. The endothelial capsular membrane is really where that filtration action happens. So we have glomerular endothelium, which stops formed elements from going through. So the uh, capillary is leaky, but it's not leaky enough to let the big stuff through, like red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. There's the glomerular basement membrane, which stops larger plasma proteins based on size and charge. And then the slit membranes between the pedicels of the podocytes, those filtration windows, um, that stops medium-sized, so a little bit smaller proteins from getting through. So the only stuff that should be getting through is water, um, really small ions, and kind of smaller uh, amino acids, urea, uric acid, um, other protein metabolic byproducts like creatinine, and then waste products. We also have the juxtaglomerular apparatus. That is a very fancy way of saying something that is next to the glomerulus. So juxta is like juxtaposed, uh, next to glomerular is glomerulus, um, and then apparatus is just a thing that does something. Um, so JGA for short. 
Um, so these are special cells of an afferent arteriole and the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, so kind of farther away from the start of the nephron, um, so more towards the distal convoluted tubule. So this structure, the JGA, allows specialized cells to monitor the composition of fluid in the distal convoluted tubule and adjust glomerular filtration rate accordingly. So you kind of have to monitor what's happening at the end of the nephron um, and adjust how material is passing through accordingly. So it's kind of um, feedback information. This is helping to regulate blood pressure as well as the rate of blood filtration by the kidneys, um, and it can respond to different measurements. So those juxtaglomerular cells can respond to blood osmolarity, and when blood osmolarity is high, um, those cells constrict to decrease the glomerular filtration rate that decreases your information and increases the retention of fluid. Conversely, when blood osmolarity is low, so when you have low concentrations of solutes in your blood, those cells relax, they increase glomerular filtration rate, increase your information um, so that you're getting rid of fluid and so that you have higher blood osmolarity proportionally. So both of those mechanisms are to restore homeostatic balance of blood, blood osmolarity. We also have the macula densa, so that's a cluster of cuboidal epithelium that is related to the RAS system, that renin angiotensin aldosterone system that increases blood pressure. Um, so they monitor fluid composition um, through the distal convoluted tubule, and then they regulate the release of renin. Renin is the important start of that renin angiotensin aldosterone system with angiotensin coming from the liver um, that gets converted using ACE, that angiotensin converting enzyme to angiotensin II, which stimulates aldosterone uh, to increase our uptake of sodium um, from the nephron. So we're kind of increasing that um, blood osmolarity again. Um, we also increase the amount of ADH, which you should have learned about in anatomy, but this is a really important hormone uh, that inserts aquaporins into our collecting ducts, allows us to take water back, reabsorb it, um, that increases blood volume and increases blood pressure. So I know I said a lot verbally, we're gonna continue to unpack that throughout this lecture, so don't stress out if that didn't make sense all at once. I just wanted to remind you, filtration is that process of going from the blood into the nephron, um, so from the capillaries into the nephron. Reabsorption is getting material back from the nephron. Secretion is putting stuff into the nephron after that filtration point. And excretion is anything that's left in there getting through the collecting ducts. So when we're looking at the structure of the nephron, um, a lot of the twisty portions are up in the cortex and then the loop of Henle is what extends into the medulla. So after material passes through the glomerulus and becomes filtrate, it passes through the following structures. Uh, Bowman's capsule, so actual filtration, the proximal convoluted tubule or PTC, or sorry, I should say PCT. I think, uh, I don't know why it autocorrected, but I'll fix it before I post this. Actually, it's recording. I'm not going to be able to fix it. It should say PCT. Sorry about that. Um, but proximal means close, convoluted means confusing or twisty, and tubule is a fancy way of saying tube. So proximal tubule or proximal convoluted tubule just means close twisty tube. So that's the first portion where we have a lot of reabsorption taking place. Um, we'll talk about what's happening there in a little bit. And then we have the descending arm or limb of the loop of Henle, which is permeable to water. We have the ascending, ascending limb of the loop of Henle, which is not permeable to water. So we have a lot of cool stuff going on with concentration gradients there. Um, for the descending limb, it starts out a lot thicker and then gets thin um, for an extended period of time. The ascending limb starts out thin and then very quickly gets thicker. So there's a little bit of difference in structure there. Um, then we get into the distal convoluted tubule. Again, that should say DCT. I'm really sorry about that. But um, distal is like distant, so it's the farther away twisty tube. And then after that, we get into the collecting duct. 
So I briefly mentioned aquaporins. Those are an important structure when we're thinking about the collecting duct and that material that's passing through and about to be excreted. Because at that point, we often have a lot of water still present. Um, and so it's really important to insert these aquaporins, aqua meaning water, porin meaning pore or channel, uh, into the plasma membrane of cells lining that collecting duct as water flows through if there's no aquaporins, it's just going to pass right through, make its way to the ureters and then the bladder. But if there are aquaporins, then there's openings, it's leaky, and that water passing through is able to go back into our body and be reabsorbed in that collecting duct. So the more aquaporins that are present, the more reabsorption of water there is and the lower the volumes of urine. The less aquaporins there are, the lower the reabsorption of water and the higher the volume of urine. And the insertion of those aquaporins into the membranes of the collecting duct is regulated by antidiuretic hormone or ADH. And again, we'll get back to that in the last part of the lecture. So when we're thinking about material flowing um, through this system, so going from our blood into our nephrons, we have to consider different forces that are at play from the fluid that is present, so from that plasma. So when we're talking about hydrostatic forces, this is pressure produced by fluid against a surface. So focusing more on this idea of just fluid dynamics, fluid movement. Um, and so when uh, we have high, um, high pressure of, uh, from that fluid, uh, it's gonna move from that high pressure to a lower pressure area. So net movement occurs in the direction of that lower hydrostatic pressure. We also have to keep in mind though that this material is not just fluid, it's solvent. So um, it also has other things within it like proteins and solutes within the blood plasma. We have hydrostatic forces as well as colloid osmotic forces. And when we calculate a lot of these things, those words come into play in the names and the calculations, so just keep that in mind. There's both outward and inward forces that contribute to the rate of filtration occurring from the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule and the nephron. Um, and so there's a few different components. The outward force you can see indicated by these purple arrows here. Um, and so that's this glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So uh, it's also called glomerular, uh, glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, which is why that V is there. So that GBHP contributes to the outward pressure. And then we see the inward pressure coming from this capsular hydrostatic pressure and with the green arrows, and then the blood colloid osmotic pressure with the orange arrows. So that's the inward forces. And so this outward pressure is counteracted by inward pressure, BCOP, blood colloid osmotic pressure, and CHP, capsular hydrostatic pressure. Those contribute to inward pressure. So there's a lot of autoregulatory mechanisms in the kidney, um, and oftentimes in a healthy adult, uh, GBHP is roughly 55 millimeters of mercury in terms of the pressure measurement, um, BCOP is usually 30 millimeters of mercury, and CHP is usually 15 millimeters of mercury. Um, so we'll get back to that in just a moment, but those numbers are there because they're normal ranges. The glomerular filtration rate is the volume of filtrate formed by both kidneys per minute. Um, it's regulated by the afferent arterial and the efferent arterial. Um, so basically, if you have a wide diameter for the afferent arterial, you're letting a lot of material in and it's able to spend more time filtering in that glomerular region. Um, if the efferent arterial has a wider diameter, material is leaving more quickly, and so you have a lower glomerular filtration rate because material is not sticking around to move through those filtration units. Um, but on average, that glomerular filtration rate, remember it's a rate, so it's per unit time per day or per minute, um, 
in this case per minute, uh, it's about 105 to 125 mils per minute. So it's how much filtration is being formed or how much filtrate is being formed. Um, remember that that's a lot of volume. Uh, 125 mils per single minute is a lot of volume in a very short amount of time. And we're definitely not making that much urine. So a lot of that material is going to get reabsorbed in fact, 99% of it returns to circulation. So that filtration in the glomerulus occurs when hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus exceeds hydrostatic pressure inside the lumen of Bowman's capsule or Bowman's space. Um, so we have material moving from high pressure to low pressure. So that glomerulus we can see indicated by that gold star and Bowman's capsule or glomerular space or Bowman space is indicated by the green star. So net filtration pressure is also a useful measurement to calculate. It's the sum of all hydrostatic and osmotic pressures, those different values, um, B8, uh, uh, BHP or GBHP, um, BCOP, and CHP that we've been talking about. Um, and this also contributes to glomerular filtration rate. So these numbers are values that um, are kind of what you would expect to see in a healthy adult. Um, and so that 10 mil, uh, millimeters of mercury, we'll figure out on the next slide how we calculate that. So when we're calculating net filtration pressure, um, NFP, that's equal to that outward pressure minus inward pressure. So the sum of the components that make up inward pressure. Um, and the BHP must be at least 45 millimeters of mercury to exceed that inward pressure. Um, the inward pressure, remember, uh, is usually around close to 45 millimeters of mercury. So the GBHP, the outward pressure, has to be at least that much to start to have any hope of exceeding it. And on average, it's around 55. Um, so we have an idea of the factors that affect glomerular filtration rate, but we also might want to quantitatively measure it in a clinical setting because it is important for a lot of diagnostics. So, first way of doing that, our first option is to take a molecule called inulin and administer it through an IV. Inulin is a plant polysaccharide that goes through filtration but is not reabsorbed or secreted. So it allows us to get a really clean look at filtration rates. We can also look at creatinine, which is a metabolic byproduct of creatine. It's filtered and it's not reabsorbed, it's only slightly secreted. And so creatinine measurements um, are a really common way that we look at filtration rates. When the granular filtration rates are too low, then you need some external thing that's going to help you perform that homeostatic function of the kidney, and that is dialysis. So you can go through hemodialysis, which is external, or peritoneal dialysis, which is internal. So there's a lot of filtration and reabsorption that happens in the kidneys. It's their primary function. Um, about 100 liters of fluid per day pass through the kidneys, but obviously we don't excrete 180 liters of urine per day. Um, so clearly not everything that passes into the kidneys becomes urine, and different parts of the nephron are responsible for both active and passive reabsorption or recovery of material from filtrate. So again, not all of that filtrate becomes urine, we reabsorb a lot of it. Some of that filtrate is almost entirely reabsorbed. So most glucose, calcium ions, sodium ions, and amino acids it, that enter into the filtrate are almost completely reabsorbed by the time uh, the filtrate reaches the loop of Henle, and then especially by the time it reaches the collecting ducts. Um, so in this diagram, reabsorption is indicated uh, in light purple color, um, and secretion is indicated by the light yellow color. So uh, for secretion, we have material, remember, entering into the nephron. That's things like urea and uric acid, some drugs and waste products, um, different things that affect pH. Um, those are entering back into the uh, nephron. 
but we're taking back things that we need, like glucose, amino acids, proteins, vitamins, lactate, um, some urea and uric acid, lots of different ions, and, so, and especially water. So we want to hang on to those things. We don't want to get rid of them. Um, so sodium ion is especially important if you think back to the nervous system and the muscular system. Remember, sodium plays a crucial role in man maintaining membrane potential and allowing us to send electrochemical signal. Uh, sodium is also very tiny and only has a single charge, so it really easily passes through those filtration units and into the filtrate. So we have to reabsorb a lot of it, and the bulk of the reabsorption happens actively in the primary convoluted tubule. Um, a lot of the reabsorption also happens in the ascending limb, first passively, then actively, some in the distal convoluted tubule and some in the collecting duct. Remember, we talked about that renin, um, aldose, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And so um, aldosterone stimulates reabsorption of sodium ions in the collecting duct, which in turn increases blood pressure. So osmosis, the movement of water, is also very important for establishing concentration gradients and allowing passive reabsorption of solutes. So additive transport of sodium um, oftentimes promotes reabsorption of water by changing different um, tonicities and drawing water out. There's also parts of the nephron that are only permeable to water, not permeable to other ions because of those aquaporins. Um, and 65% of water um, the filtrate is actually reabsorbed uh, in the primary convoluted tubule, and then a lot is reabsorbed in the descending arm of the loop of Henle. So that establishes concentration gradients, and then different ions like potassium, chloride, um, carbonate, as well as urea um, have these strong concentration gradients that are established after water leaves the filtrate, so they become much more concentrated, and then they're able to really easily pass back into our body through passive diffusion. The bigger molecules like glucose and amino acids rely on symporters. Um, and so here we have an example of symporters. Um, this purple is showing the action of a sodium potassium pump that establishes concentration gradients. So there's a lot of sodium outside the cell in the extracellular fluid. These uh, darker purple guys right here are the symporters, and so there's a lot of sodium out here. It goes into the symporter at the same time as glucose. So um, glucose is able to move through across the membrane with this um, molecule of, so or with not molecule, with this ion of sodium. So they're transported together. They are symported. In this example, it's going from the outside in. Uh, in the case of our um, nephron, it might be going from the inside out. But to kind of help visualize that, we have the sodium potassium pump forming a gradient. And again, that gradient is really important for transporting material through the symport, which we see here. And so that symport uh, works at a, a constant, or not a constant rate, but there's a kind of maximum to how it can work. Um, PM is the transport maximum, so there's a limit to how quickly the symporter can function. So this is a form of secondary active transport. Um, that means that we're spending ATP to establish the concentration gradient of sodium, uh, but then we're using that concentration gradient that's established to passively move larger molecules um, through secondary active transport. So it's still considered active transport because we had to use energy to establish that concentration gradient. So if we have glucose not fully being removed from the urine and making its way into the urine, that's called glucosuria or glycosuria. Um, so that's when the concentration of urine uh, or concentration of glucose in the urine is too high. This is due to a couple of things. It can happen when your concentration of glucose in the blood is way too high. And so then there's just a proportionally higher amount in the filtrate and then in the urine or if there is a problem with those symporters or other tubular carrier mechanisms. Um, it can also be symptomatic of untreated diabetes. 
So uh, there's these glucose test strips. Um, I believe you're going to have kind of samples in lab where you're able to use these. Um, so you might be able to use these glucose test strips and see if the samples you have, um, these test solutions, have high glucose or elevated glucose glycosuria. So when stuff is moving through the glomerulus and entering into uh, Bowman space and Bowman's capsule and the nephron, um, we have really high, not high pressure, not really high pressure, but we have um, a consistently higher pressure outside than inside that's fueling that flow um, that's, uh, again, sustained by the kind of changes in the afferent and afferent arterioles that supply and remove blood from that area. Um, so your blood pressure can change quite a bit in your body and it doesn't necessarily affect your glomerular filtration rate because you're changing the flow of blood into the glomerulus and out of the glomerulus. Um, but when you're in the proximal convoluted tubule, the flow of material is determined by osmoregulation and concentration gradients. So it's already there. We're not necessarily physically changing the flow. Um, we're setting up concentration gradients and changing those in the proximal convoluted tubule as well as in the loop of Henle. So the countercurrent multiplier system is an important part of tubular reabsorption. Um, so the descending arm of the loop of Henle is very, very permeable to water um, due to there being lots of aquaporins. It's not necessarily permeable to things like sodium and chloride. Um, but urea can also pass in. It can be secreted into the nephron at this point. So water flows out and then urea flows in. And so you're really concentrating the material that's inside the loop of Henle. Um, it's becoming very hypertonic and the outside environment is very, becoming very hypotonic. So the change in that concentration gradient is then in the ascending arm going to draw sodium and calcium ions out. So we have, you know, the internal environment of the nephron becoming very concentrated. We have the external environment being very uh, hypotonic, very not concentrated. And so when you have less aquaporins in the ascending arm, it's not as permeable to water. Um, we have the sodium and the chloride being drawn out. So that's where a lot of reabsorption happens as well, um, specifically of sodium ion. And so the contrasting flows of the different arms, the descending and ascending arms is the countercurrent part of it. And then the action of solute pumps to change concentrations is the multiplier part of it. Um, so that's a really important process as well. So remember that um, there's some filtrate that's coming through the actual process of filtration. There's some that's secreted that comes from sources along the nephron. So tubular secretion is the movement of material from the blood or tubule cells into tubular fluid after we've already passed Bowman's capsule. Um, so that's again indicated by the pale yellow in this diagram. So things like urea, uric acid, some drugs, um, different uh, pH buffering components, um, potassium ion, uh, and uh, different protein waste products, um, as well as creatinine, which we talked about earlier, but only to some extent. Remember, creatinine is important for measuring glomerular filtration rate, and so not much is secreted. So this process of secretion is really important because it gets rid of certain materials. Um, so it allows us to add stuff to the filtrate and get rid of it. And it also helps control blood pH. So we're able to secrete a lot of hydrogen this way. Um, so uh, we're making the urine much more acidic than our blood and regulating um, that proton balance as well as bicarbonate balance. Um, and we can do this so effectively, we can get rid of uh, protons so effectively in our urine, but uh, urine can be up to a thousand times more acidic than our blood. So remember, uh, when we looked at the urinalysis earlier in the lecture, that urine had quite a wide range of pH. We changed the pH of our urine um, depending on the homeostatic mechanisms that control our blood. So you saw this diagram earlier, it's just kind of a summary. Um, this is also another summary that I would usually diagram on the board, but again, I really encourage you uh, to look at that video that I posted in the additional study resources that has the guide diagramming it um, step by step.
So while filtration, reabsorption, and secretion are the primary functions of the kidney, there's a lot of secondary functions as well. Um, we talked about that renin, uh, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So kidneys are responsible for um, the hormone renin, which is involved in raising blood pressure. When we talked about altitude sickness, we talked about erythropoietin for hematopoiesis, production of RBC, um, red blood cells. And so kidneys sense hypoxemia and secrete that hormone. Um, and then they're also important for calcium absorption because they convert calcidiol into calcitriol, the active form of vitamin D. So they're involved in blood pressure, red blood cell production, and calcium reabsorption or calcium absorption um, as well, not just filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Okay, so we're going to briefly talk about some aspects of this next chapter specifically in terms of water balance. And so this is the last bit of material that will be on the quiz. The next lecture will not be on this quiz, it will be on the next quiz. So when we're thinking about water balance, we're uh, thinking a lot about osmolality and osmolarity, we talked about that earlier as well. So osmolality is the ratio of solutes um, in blood plasma to water in blood plasma, the volume of solvent in a solution. Um, and so when we're thinking about hydration and how our body perceives that, we're thinking about plasma osmolality. So when we don't have enough water in our body, when that osmolality level is um, too high, it's increased, um, our blood volume is also decreased. Um, so there's a couple of different responses there, both to that decrease in blood volume relatively and the increase in blood osmolality. Um, a decrease in blood volume also decreases blood pressure. And so then we have our RAS system, which takes effect, um, increasing levels of angiotensin 2, first renin, then angiotensin 1, then angiotensin 2. Um, the increase in blood osmolality uh, activates osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus and also uh, causes us to have dry mouth. Both of those, and as well as the increase in angiotensin 2, stimulate the thirst center in the hypothalamus. That increases our desire to drink water. We take in water, and then that decreases blood osmolality. The RAS system also involves the release of antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, from the hypothalamus. Um, so there's a lot of stuff at play here. We have a lot of uh, stuff happening in the hypothalamus. We have blood being changed, constricting arterioles so that not as much filtration might be happening. And then when material is filtered through, we're increasing reabsorption of water in the kidneys. So when we're talking about diuretic, those are things that increase the volume of urine. They make you have to urinate more. So uh, when we talk about something like caffeine or alcohol or different medications, some of those might be diuretics. They make you have to pee. Antidiuretics are things that make you not have to urinate because they uh, decrease the volume of your urine. So they work against diuretics. Um, antidiuretic hormone is a hormone that a chemical signaling molecule that works against diuretics. So it's a chemical signaling molecule or hormone that controls the amount of water reabsorbed through the collecting ducts and tubules of the kidney. Remember, it does that by inserting those aqua or by cueing those aquaporins to be inserted. Um, and I should add that uh, it's not necessarily that antidiuretic hormone is working against diuretics. It's just not a diuretic. It's the opposite action of a diuretic. Um, a lot of diuretics like caffeine and alcohol actually deregulate or downregulate your production of antidiuretic hormones. So they are directly working against ADH. Um, ADH just means that you don't have to pee as much. Um, so again, those aquaporins are being inserted into the membrane, and then we have more water reabsorption and decreased volume of urine. So it signals those epithelial cells to insert aquaporins into the cell membranes along the collecting ducts. That increases the permeability of those collecting ducts to water. We reabsorb more water. We decrease the volume of urine, lower volume, higher 
concentration urine. Um, and so as we kind of get older, when we're not babies anymore, we start producing ADH more at nighttime. That's why we don't have to urinate as much at night. Um, we kind of lose control of those um, regulatory cycles when we get older and end up uh, not producing as much ADH as at night, which is oftentimes why you have to pee more at night when you're older, in addition to kind of changing musculature in the bladder. So when we're thinking about ADH and applying that, you should think about whether caffeine and alcohol increase or decrease production of ADH, um, how that affects the physiology of the nephron, how this affects collecting ducts, aquaporins, and the volume of urine, and you should think about the mechanism by which diuretics such as caffeine and alcohol affect ADH production. So remember the rest of the homeostasis, chapter 26, chapter lecture will be posted separately. It will not be on the next quiz, but this material will be. As always, please email me if you have any questions and I'll get the resource for lecture exam at number two posted soon.